Hi, everyone. My name is Randy Myers. I'm so thrilled to be here moderating a Q&A for you after, this, after Assassins. I know you have so many questions like I had about how this film was made, everything about it. I was just riveted the first time and I was just talking to producer Jessica Hargra Hargrave just a little while ago and mentioned I watched it again because I just had to see it all over again, see how we oh yeah, were able to cobble it all together. So it's quite a pleasure to have both here. We're gonna start with Jessica Har Hargrave, the producer, and then we're gonna have Ryan White, the director. They have been a cl collaborating, collaborating together for quite some time now and have won, um, won awards in the process. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I think all of us are probably wondering how this came about. Did it did it happen after the headline or before? <laughs> how could you how how could you make this all work? Because it seemed like we, you were right there at the beginning to the end. Um, it's so Kim Jong Nam was murdered in February two thousand seventeen, and both Ryan and I remember clearly reading the headlines about his assassination and about two female assassins, and remember taking note of that and thinking that that was unusual and interesting. But pretty quickly, the American press got swept up by the fact that February two thousand seventeen was also Donald Trump's first month and full month in office. And um, it just really got lost in the American press, that, that story did, and, and what was underneath the headline. But we got a call, we had a series called The Keepers, which um, came out on Netflix. It was investigative in nature and, and dark, and it um, came out in May of 2017, so just a couple months later. And we got a call from a journalist named Doug Clark, who said, do you remember that assassination? Yes, well, you know, do you know what really happened? And we said, no, please, of course, tell us. And he started telling us, what the women were presenting or planning to present, what he had heard the women were planning to present as their defense, which was that they thought they were on a reality show. And both of us just, what? You know, just really skeptical, honestly. Like that just sounds really preposterous. That doesn't sound believable. But Doug had been working on an article for a while at that point and said, there's really something there. I think that, you know, you should take a look at it. And I'm interested in seeing if, in addition to my article, there might be a documentary angle to take. So within a couple of weeks, um, Doug and Ryan were on a plane to Malaysia to start filming. That's pretty amazing that you just started just going right into it. I mean, in the process, when you when you were, when you were making it, you, there were so many things that you were able to get that it seemed like other people weren't able to actually. Getting the interview with the taxi driver was one that. How you found that person? Uh, did that take a lot of legwork, or did these some of these things just sort of happen while you were doing doing that? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Um, I think Doug, the journalist that Jess mentioned, he had done a lot of legwork before we arrived. So the idea that we just landed on the ground and already had access to some of like the main sources from you know, from behind the scenes in this story was was rare as a documentary filmmaker to have that uh, to have that opportunity. The difference being people that had participated in Doug's article, once there's a video camera there and the word movie is thrown around, adds a whole different level of the fear factor to people. So um, you mentioned the taxi driver, John, who actually was not included in Doug's article, but Doug had gotten access to him and had gotten him to agree to participate in the film. And I'll never forget the night when we were supposed to interview John and we were in um, a mall in Kuala Lumpur at like 2 a.m., 1 a.m., something like that. Um, and we're supposed to meet with John uh, at a coffee shop. And he came, um, it was just Doug and I having a coffee. Our cameraman was outside. Uh, he came to the door and looked at us and just got totally spooked and started sprinting out of the mall. Mm -hmm. and. Doug, being the very aggressive investigative journalist that he is, chased him uh, and chased him down. And John was jumping in his taxi and trying to drive away. And John, uh, Doug jump, jumped in the front seat with him and sort of talked him off the ledge. And, you know, 30 minutes later, he brought John back in the coffee shop and John had come down and John agreed to be filmed. So of that type of stuff that felt like we were living in a spy movie or something where people understandably were totally spooked about putting their face or name as a source on this story, you know? And we felt that firsthand too, as the filmmakers, everyone knows 
uh, the North Korean regime is very dangerous when it comes to cyber security, if not physical security as well. So we were kind of all, always um, watching our backs in some ways or, or a, little, a little paranoid about who might be watching us or who might be following us. So that, that sense of, of, uh, of dread was kind of there the entire time we were making the film. Well, that's what I was thinking about too. I was, was just thinking back to the interview with uh, Seth Rogen and James Franco and everything that happened with that. Was there ever a point when you were making this that you did feel like you were getting pressure from outside forces uh, that did not want you to make this film? There, we were always aware of the threat, certainly. And so we met from the beginning with people who were trained in security and in consulting in this way so that we could protect ourselves uh, as much as possible. Although we were told by them, it's not a it's not an if it's a win in terms of how these things operate. Like you can't protect yourself entirely from a threat like a, like the North Korean regime if they decide they're gonna come after you. So we did the best that we could to protect ourselves in terms of, you know, we used burner computers when we needed to. We kept all of our computers off of the internet that had access to the project so that they were completely air gapped and isolated from each other. We used paper documents more than we ever had in the past. Um, and secure forms of communication. Um, so we tried to build up a barrier as much as we could uh, around the project to protect ourselves. Did we get weird emails? Yes. Did we have things that we were unsure about their sources? Yes. Um, do I know for sure that all of those were innocent, you know, happenstance? No, um, but it's just really difficult to, to pinpoint exactly what's going on. So the best that we could do was protect ourselves as much as we possibly could and be smarter about that stuff than we've ever been in the past and smarter about and more proactive about trying to be protected. That's excellent. Well, what as far as the gaining access to um, City and Don, how, how did that go, go about? Were you able to get much access since they were in prison? I saw some video, but it seemed like that would have been a, the most challenging part to actually gain access f to get their stories uh, presented with you both doing that. Yeah, we had no access to them while they were in prison because they were in solitary confinement and they aren't allowed visitors. Even their lawyers were, you know, it's not like the American system where lawyers are going in and out with their clients all the time. Even the lawyers uh, could rarely visit them and have meetings with them. Um, and so they were complete mystery figures to us in that sense, which is, um, you know, if the audience has seen the film now, which is how we edit the film, you know, at the beginning, they appeared like femme fatale, um, Black Widow killers, that's what the world thought of them. And our film is kind of that slow burn in revealing who they are in the same way that we started through our own investigations, um, understanding who they are. So, you know, obviously we had access to them in the end after they were released from prison. Um, and that wasn't an easy uh, ask by any means because these were two women who had just been tricked by a film crew. Um, mm -hmm and had almost ended up dying because of it um, in multiple ways from the VX and from the death penalty. And suddenly they're released from prison and they're back in their hometowns and they have another film crew coming to them saying, trust us, you know, we're taking care of your story. You can believe us. And so that, that took a lot of jumping through hoops. It wasn't easy to get um, both women to participate. We were lucky by that point, because we were a couple years into the film, that both their legal teams and their families knew us very well, because we had spent a lot of time with both of them. That two circles of people that both women trusted were vouching for us and saying like, no, these are, these are good guys. They're not, you know, they're not uh, out to get you. Um, but getting both women to participate, I think, was one of the biggest challenges. And I think I'm very uh, grateful to both of them for having participated in the end. It would have been really hard without their voices at the end or with one of their voices and not the other one um, to really finish the film, I think. So I really um, am thankful to them because it was a whole nother leap of faith for them to do that. Definitely, I, I felt that uh, you feel that through, throughout what they had, to, the ordeal they went through and how that just sort of affected their lives afterwards getting out and not and trying to lead a normal life is the thing where you just left with after being, you know, considered killers. Um, what was the, 
for for you while you were doing it was did it shock you while you were making this film i mean it seems like each development that that happens you must have been at the same time rather stunned and saying how are you going to be able to um this i'm going down this road now versus another road because of everything that was going on as it unfolded with you that was kind of the the opportunity this film handed us i think which is very rare that you know we had done true crime stories before and we had done big news stories before but this was kind of both of those things it was a it was a massive true crime story on probably the most highest geopolitical scale um, but it was, and it was a top news story, but it was a story that nobody seemed to know what the backstory was, at least Americans, you know, and I think Jess mentioned this at the beginning that Trump took office right as this assassination was taking place and the last four years have been so crazy and dominated by the Trump administration that no one paid attention. You know, if this assassination had, had had happened during the Obama years, you know, I think we would have been talking about it ad nauseum. I think the whole world would have been obsessed with the story. Um, but I think Americans in a lot of ways missed it because Trump was dominating the airwaves. So all the twists and turns that the case took or the stories of the women took, I think it presented us a unique opportunity in that we knew that the audience probably would not know um, what was about to happen. Um, and so that's why we kind of edited it as a thriller. And, and speaking of the women, we had to make a choice at the beginning um, once we got access to them, do we edit their voices into the entire film? You know, we could have mm -hmm. begun the film revealing that the women survived this and that we had access to them and they could have told the story from the beginning. Um, but we wanted it to be, you know, sort of an edge of the seat, edge of your seat thriller, just the way we had experienced it. Because, yes, to your question, this took so many shocking twists and turns that it, it became difficult to keep up with. Um, and so we, I think our editor, Helen Kearns, and her team did an amazing job making that make sense to an audience, because often it was completely nonsensical while we were living it. Um, and so I think that was one of the biggest challenges was how do you take all of these crazy twists and turns and make them digestible or discernible for an audience? Well, have they seen the film too? And how, what is what is the reaction been? The film has not come out in their countries yet. So it's being um, translated right now, but it is it is coming out in Indonesia and Vietnam. So they will, they will be seeing it soon. Um, I think both of them are very, um, I don't know what the word for it would be. They're, they're sort of very removed from the spotlight now. Um, you know, it's crazy because the year of coronavirus happened in between this. So we forget how much time has elapsed since they were released from prison and a very isolating time. So I think both women in a lot of ways have been able to, I wouldn't say they've resumed their normal lives, but they've been able to kind of um, disappear back into anonymity um, in a way that they both wanted. That, that From the moments I met them, I could tell they both did not want, um, you know, and ironically for Dwan, who had spent, you know, a decade chasing fame, by the time I met her, she really did not want anyone knowing who she was anymore. Um, and in fact, she wanted no one knowing who she was. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I think, you know, you could make the case that our film, um, makes the case for their innocence or exonerates them in some way, but it's also going to bring them back into the spotlight. Um, and so that's something that we'll be having conversations with them both about um, as the film comes out in their respective countries. Well, I really liked how you actually show the social media reaction, uh, putting that element in, showing what they, how, what they were contending with as soon as they were released uh, to see that. Um, that's pretty damaging for someone to, to to go through. Um, yeah, I think you can even, oh, sorry, Ryan. Um, <laughs> do you wanna go? I was just gonna say, I think you can even see that and you can see the response to that in Dwan in the sense that when she first gets off the plane and is asked, what do you want to do? She says, I wanna, I wanna be an actress and that's still her goal and that's still something she's interested in. And after years of isolation from, in a way, in a way, almost being protected from what people were saying about her and what the what the world was, how the world was viewing this, because she was isolated from that, she was still persisting in that dream. But then once she um, was out and and heard and saw this response, mm -hmm. it changes a person, and you start to recognize and maybe think that this isn't what I want to pursue. And then we have her. I mean, that's like 
you know, right after she gets out of jail. And then the interview with her later where she's talking about how she views the world and that she says she doesn't view the world as that same pink hue anymore. It's because time has elapsed and she's starting to recognize that, that like her world is forever changed and the way that her world is forever changed. And I think Siti speaks to it as well when she, I mean, the last line in the movie is her talking about in her cell, looking up at the window and wondering if she's ever gonna see the world in all its vastness. And I think that's beautiful because at the time she means, am I ever gonna get out of this jail cell? But it, but it also to me rings true now that she's free because no, she's not. The sky is not gonna be as vast for her anymore. Her world is forever changed because of what happened to her. And the same is true for Juan. You were talking about some of the challenges getting this film made, and part of, part of that was actually getting uh, getting access to both of them towards the end. Uh, what were some of the other things that were uh, were specifically a huge challenge to overcome? Um, I think definitely like a, a very specific edit challenge was the CCTV footage, which when we were given. Um, we were given access through multiple hands to a stack of DVDs and said, here's the CCTV footage of the incident. There was no other information. So that is like a kind of a, a very, it was a big problem that took literally months to unpack and unravel because it was like, we don't know what we're looking for in these scenes. We're trying to figure out who everyone is and then how do we convey that to an audience? So that's more of like a micro scale. Um, I would say macro scale, it, it relates in many ways back to the challenges of doing a story about North Korea, um, the security challenges, um, the people who might have otherwise worked with you but are uncomfortable because of, of the, the subject matter challenges. I think that that was definitely something that we've had to work through and just being aware of it ourselves. I think at first we were we were just like, like I said, we just, you know, ready to go. Let's start filming this. And then you start to think, okay, this is actually, uh, maybe we need to recognize the situation that we're in and be more careful about it. So I think that that was one of the bigger macro challenges was just the fact that this is about North Korea, but it's also geopolitical and it's involving the countries, sorry, the governments of multiple countries as well. And you two have worked together. You've collaborated for many great uh, documentary series from The Keepers on Netflix to just recently um, doing, doing the Visible out on television for Apple TV Plus, The Case Against Eight. Um, what is the key to your success of working together? Well, we've been working together since we were 12 years old. <laughs> I love it. So I guess the answer would be longevity. Uh, <laughs> You just named projects for the last five years, but it's been <laughs> decades um, in the making. Yeah, we grew up together. Uh, so we were making films when we were in sixth and seventh grade that um, were sort of the foundation <laughs> of what of what we do now. Um, you know, I think documentaries are a very interesting career path because when we were joining the workforce, it was supposed to be, you know, sort of this vow of poverty. And it was seen as sort of the, the direction you go in if you never want a life of success or money or popularity. Um, and we, that's been proven wrong over the last, you know, the last 15 years. So uh, for us, I think we're just so thrilled that we can actually make a living doing this career and that we can actually make, you know, at the beginning in our 20s, we were making one film at a time and doing side jobs. And it, they took many years and, you know, I was shooting and editing them myself. Now we're able to make, you know, three or four, sometimes more things at the same time um, because of the thriving documentary industry, because of the massive uh, audience interest in these films. But I think just in my relationship also allows that like extreme amount of output that we've known each other for so long that there's so much trust there and there's so much understanding on, um, there's an unspoken language on who's going to handle what. So I can be out there in the world, you know, without cell phone service, shooting something very dangerous and Jess can be delivering visible out on television to Apple and I don't need to worry about it. So, you know, we, we're lucky because we have such a longstanding relationship. There's many other um, director producer com combinations that uh, might not have been childhood best friends, but also have those longstanding relationships. And whenever we're talking 
to young directors or young producers, that's one of our first pieces of advice is like, find someone with that other talent, find a producer talent or find a director talent, whichever one you don't have and partner up with that person. Because once you find that, that partnership, then, then you can um, achieve and output so much more than you could on your own. And are you, uh, you uh, have just one last question for you. And are you seeing that there are more, uh, there's more interest in documentaries, particularly now, because there's access that you can get those films so much easier than what you used to be able to because of being sort of not more in a lockdown mode where they, they are, you're, it's becoming more apparent there's so many out there for the general public. Yeah, I mean, we, we were, we were in the top 10 films on iTunes this weekend and that's a documentary, you know, I don't think, but besides a handful of documentaries, you know, 20 years ago that really broke through in a big way and kind of paved the way for the abundance of documentaries now that wasn't, that wasn't happening. So um, yeah, and I mean the, 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 the boom of the streaming platforms and the, and the series, I mean, Assassins is a film, but we've made, many documentary series that have probably, you know, The Keepers is by far our most popular thing. That was seven parts. Like the idea that audiences are sitting down in their living rooms to watch, you know, a seven or eight hour documentary is, is mind blowing. That wasn't, that wasn't even, you know, a possibility when we were coming out of college and joining the workforce of documentaries, we were making, you know, 90 minute films tops. Uh, so the 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 boom that we've seen over the last couple of, a couple of years is very very exciting. I think. Do you agree, Jess? Yeah, it's very exciting. We're very lucky to have been a part of that, and it's timed well for us. So as we've been able to take more on, audiences have shown more interest, which is great. So is that something that you'd like to pursue again? Is doing a long format where you're actually into a docu series? We're always doing both. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of depends on whether we feel the story demands it. And Assassins is a great example where we had many meetings um, at the beginning where, where companies wanted to make it into a series um, because there's more money there and there's more eyeballs and there's more real estate on the streaming services if they can supply eight hours instead of 90 minutes. But we were pretty hellbent from the very beginning that uh, Assassins was a stronger three act film than it was um, stretching it out unnecessarily, but yeah, I mean, if the if the story if the story demands it, we're always open to the series format. It's a very very exciting uh, new way of getting to tell our stories. So we're definitely going to continue doing both and and short films. You know, all three are are different ways to tell different types of stories. It just depends on on what the demand is. Well, thank you too so much for taking the time out. As I said, this is one of my favorite documentaries of, of 2020 and going into 2021 now <laughs> because, I, because I watched it again. Uh, thank you for taking the time. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to you and continued success and all the things that you're doing and you're bringing to us to illuminate the world in so many different ways. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.